And Inga, I believe I managed to give you uh, with that, Nicole. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good day, everybody, from wherever you're uh, joining us from. Um, we are recording this meeting, so if you do not wish to uh, be recorded, you should leave at this point. Uh, this is, I'm delighted to say, the 80th meeting of the Strong right. Sustainable Business Model Group, so I think we deserve a little yeah. round of applause for making this uh, milestone. Uh, and uh, so we, we're, we're now sort of part way through our seventh year uh, of operation. Um, and uh, it's absolutely wonderful that we have this month as our speakers, uh, some uh, policy analysts and uh, people who have been working uh, at the Flemish government in the Department of uh, Land Use Planning, the Sp Spatial Planning and Environment, if I remember this correctly, uh, the English translation of the Flemish. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, let them introduce themselves further in, in just a few uh, moments. Um, so, uh, as, as is usual, I just wanted to say a few words about the group for those of uh, you who are joining for the first time. And we have a number of, uh, at least one person in the room who hasn't been to one of our meetings before, and I think one or two online perhaps who have gone as well, including our speakers. So, um, we are the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. We are exploring how to enable entrepreneurs and established businesses to realize enterprises that choose flourishing as their goal. And this is what we've been doing since uh, 2012. Um, and um, inspired by the uh, Canadian Truth and Reconciliation process with uh, the First uh, Nations here in Canada, uh, we like to start with a, an acknowledgement of our privilege. Uh, this has been adjusted given the global audience uh, that we have here. So uh, wherever you are today, this is sacred land on which each of us is privileged to be. And this land and the nearby lakes and sea has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. We are privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and indeed beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honour and respect peoples indigenous to your place, including perhaps yourselves. Today, each place around the world is increasingly the home to people from across the world, and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. So that's very much an acknowledgement from a social uh, and geographical perspective, but what about uh, from a biophysical perspective? Uh, so uh, this is uh, the building in which we're in today, uh, here in Toronto. Uh, we're down at the bottom in, in the red brick building at the far end of that photograph, with the CN Tower in the background. And so I'd invite you to consider wh where you are, wherever that is, what is the watershed in which you uh, are based today? And if you, if you know, then you should uh, perhaps put that in, your, uh, in the chat. That would be lovely to see where, which watersheds you're all in. So here in Toronto, uh, we are in a watershed known as Russell Creek. Um, it was buried in the mid 1870s to become a sewer. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I've been looking hard, but so far I've been unable to locate any indigenous names for this uh, uh, creek. So if anybody uh, can enlighten me on that, that would be uh, great. And of course, uh, the year we are, after the Indian Act. The year after yeah. the Indian Act, there we go. Uh, and uh, the delivery of this session is important and independent with the biophysical space in which we operate. Um, as an example, just think about where the sewage connects to. And if those of you who are using the flourishing business canvas, uh, the watershed and the uh, is a collection of biophysical stocks and ecosystem services that we represent on the left hand side of the canvas for those of you who are using that tool. So we are 1,500 people, actually 1,530 people globally uh, as of uh, yesterday. And uh, we think we are the world's first and perhaps only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from a micro ecological economic perspective. So these are the economists who recognize that the economy is inside society, which is inside the environment as opposed to any other configuration. Uh, this being the configuration that natural scientists would understand. Um, we also use systemic design approaches as one of our primary epistemologies, and we have a strong normative purpose. It's to enable flourishing. We're not just here to do research. We actually want to change the world. Uh, so we get you. We think that this is what binds us all together. Uh, and um, I won't go through our goals uh, this, this time, uh, but if you want to read them, they're in the wiki. Um, and I would just remind everybody that all of our past presentations, nearly all of our past presentations, and many recordings of those past meetings are available in our Google Drive. Um, I did want to say a word or two about the Flourishing Enterprise Institute. Uh, as many of you know, um, this group uh, has long had an aspiration to move away from its voluntary basis uh, towards becoming a global planetary-wide network of nodes forming 
uh, an institute focused on flourishing enterprise. Um, and um, I'm delighted to say that um, we uh, um, secured a little bit of funding from the federal uh, Canadian, one of the federal Canadian funders of research to be able to establish a research agenda uh, for the Institute. And um, uh, at next month's meeting, uh, we will be launching a process by which everybody in the group can uh, participate in the co-creation of that research agenda uh, as, as a lead up to an input to the meeting in August. Um, and probably we will have uh, further discussions at the July meeting. And uh, we may not do the report out at the September meeting, that may be a little too soon after the meeting at August, but we might try and do the report out or start the report out yeah. in, in September. So um, it, um, the other thing is uh, at the August meeting, uh, the August meeting will be delayed by uh, a couple of days. It will be actually on the Thursday morning of the same week. And we're delighted to announce that David Cooper Ida will be the keynote speaker at the event where we're doing the agenda co-creation, and that will be live streamed. So that will be the SSBMG meeting for August, it will be David Cooper Ida's uh, speech. Uh, so David being the I, I think we could say to say the originator of the idea of flourishing enterprise, or at least that terminology, uh, building on uh, John Ehrenfeld's uh, ideas. Okay, uh, so let me just um, skip through uh, most of the rest of this. This uh, presentation will be is in the folder along with our speakers' presentation this month. Um, just to re remind everybody, the purpose of our monthly meetings is to share what our members are up to, and so uh, this month uh, uh, we have. Um, Oops, no we don't. That's, that's, the, that's last month's, Nicole. <laughs> that, that was last month's presentation, but never, nevertheless, we have uh, this month... Uh, uh, that's okay. Uh, Inga and uh, Kern from uh, the Flemish government with us. So with that said, I will stop sharing and shut up and hand it over to our uh, two speakers. Let's, so, uh, let me get the cursor over here and stop sharing. No, there's not much sharing over here. I will stop sharing. So. Inga, I think you're uh, you're sharing your the slides. Yes, I'm trying to. There we go. It's coming. Okay. There we are. There we have it. And just put your put it into full screen mode. Okay. And and Kern, when you're speaking, get as close to the microphone as you can. Okay. Um, with to, yeah, good evening or good afternoon for everyone as well. And it's nice to be able to present uh, some of the findings of our study. And it's also nice to see some familiar faces in the in in the yeah with people on the side of the screen. So uh, thank you very much for for giving us the chance. Um, my, as, as said by Anthony, my name is Suku Mizur, working for the Flemish government, and Inge is uh, actually working for PVC and who was uh, the contractor for this study. Um, as the title uh, sounds a bit provocative, maybe, that was also the purpose, as we wanted to challenge possible participants uh, in our study. And Inge, would you like to? Change to the next slide, please. So I would like to start off the presentation with a short introduction and an outline of the research questions, after which Inge will go further into detail on the approach and the insights and the results of the study. Next slide. Thank you. And in the introduction, I would like to give you a better insight uh, so you can have a better uh, view on the situation and, and the background on the research questions and the context in which the study has been executed. And therefore, I will briefly try to describe some of the char characteristics of Flanders and its current policy uh, on the green economy. Um, as most of you probably know, Flanders is the Flemish speaking part of region in Belgium and it's in the middle of the heart of Europe which makes that we have an easy access to 
major cities in less than two hours travel time. And we have also a lot of important international headquarters uh, in our Brussels region, for instance, the EU. And what we see is that over the last century, large parts of our manufacturing economy, for instance, on steel, textile, automotive and pharmaceutical industry, they left Flanders. And, but on the other hand, we stayed strongly industrialized, but we developed a more innovative and technology-based uh, service economy and that makes on the other hand that we are quite or highly dependent on import and export so we are uh, actually yeah, a transit uh, region and to support that we developed a good logistics and uh, transport network and the harbor of Antwerp with its uh, uh, chemical uh, industry about the second largest on, on worldwide is uh, a good example of that. Um, but more important to know is that our economy is characterized by a very large amount of SMEs. 80 to 90 percent of our companies could be defined as a as a me, and a lot of them are family owned. So this already uh, defines a bit the, our current economy and gives us a context in which the study has uh, yeah will. We, we'll, will be elaborated. Um, if you would like to have more insight on our economy, it's always uh, easy with the link on the presentations to go to Flanders Investment and Trade, uh, which is our you know, foreign investment uh, agency, uh, to find out more on, on Flanders if needed. This described it as a region and um, an economy. We are also a very populated or dense populated country. We have about 13,000 and a half square miles, uh, square kilometers, and about six and a half million people at the moment. So that makes about almost 400 people per square kilometer. And this, this makes that the whole of the region is, yeah, is there's a lot of pressure on, on land use and that makes it also expensive. So especially if you look at from an economical point of view. Again, if you want to do an ec economical development in Flanders, uh, space is already, or the price of the space of, uh, is, is already quite an, uh, a, yeah, a burden to, to look at. And, and the forecasts or the predictions are that by 2015, uh, 2050, the population in Flanders will uh, probably uh, increase with another 14, 15%. So in fact, Flanders will be in the end, one large city where there is less and less separation between different land uses and activity. So this being said, um, this gives you a good view on the possible future challenges and existing challenges our environment uh, already has. So there is definitely a need as a government to develop a policy and a view on how we want to green or green, yeah, green the economy. Inge, if you could go to the next slide, please. We use this uh, three sentence long definition as a, as a description on how we see a green economy in, in Flanders. Instead of reading it, I would like to just yeah, uh, say out, I, or uh, look out to the major keywords in this uh, sentence, which we, which are meaningful development, new dynamic opportunities, creative solutions, innovative entrepreneurs, but certainly, uh, and last but not least, uh, the part of competitiveness is as well important. Kern, I, I think you said you were okay taking questions as, as you go through. I'm curious, could you just say something about how this statement was arrived at? Who was involved in crafting this statement? Making this up? Well, in, within the department, we have a, a group of people that are part of the team of the green economy. And within, within this team, we are writing, or we had already written, um, a view on how we see a green economy in Flanders, but at the moment we are updating that and, and, and renew it. And 
those three sentences here on the screen are actually more or less a condensation of all the ideas in there. So it's, it's, it's a small group of people, but this definition is used also for the, uh, the policy uh, notes for the minister. So we used, we, 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 we internally made it up and then we use this uh, externally as well at the moment. So it's more or less validated, meaning that, uh, we, which is kind of strange that for, for a circle economy, for instance, um, it, it's, it's one of the seven transitions uh, from the Flemish government. But for a green economy, we have no official uh, framework, uh, meaning there's nothing on paper in a decree or in legislation which give us uh, support to, to work on this theme. So at the moment, we are creating our own space to work around green economy. So it's... it's, it's uh, Interesting from one side, but it's dangerous as well because we are now facing at 26th of May uh, Flemish elections together with European elections. And if the new Minister of, of Environment doesn't want to talk about green economy anymore and only on circular economy, maybe it might be that our team is, is without work actually. So mm -hmm. we are struggling every day to, to have a ground to, to start from. Uh, so that's the way this definition came uh, came to, to yeah. Can I ask one, uh, is, one quick uh, question? Was the use of the phrase "striving for the perpetuation of the competitive competitiveness of the economy" contentious, or did that come from political sources or internal ones? It was. Uh, on purpose, because we didn't, yeah, we, we the, the, competitive of the, the competitiveness of the Flemish economy is a very sensitive uh, subject at the moment. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> <laughs> so for, that, for that reasons, we put in that sentence that a green economy is not the opposite of a competitive uh, Flemish economy. So we, we put it in there so that it was quite clear to everyone who would read it that, that it would be supportive to a competitive Flemish economy and not a threat. And that's the reason why we, we put it in there. Right. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Inge, if you want to go to the next slide. So, uh, yeah, just uh, do not want another other two other things. Yeah. Inge? Yeah, thank you. Um, so starting from that definition, um, the three sentences, we, we saw, of course, a lot of steps we, we could take um, uh, to support that transitions to, 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 uh, you know, to, to, to transform our economy. And within our department, we tried to support that on, on several levels. Um, so we had a colleague that was working on behavioral change and nudging. And at the moment, we are seeing that was especially on on uh, how to change uh, buying uh, food behavior uh, um, and see if you can change uh, in uh, by yeah working on nudging if you could change some things. So some of the ideas we want to see if we can use that in the greening the economy perspective as well. Uh, of course, the study we are now discussing was also a part of uh, that. Uh, action we were doing and at the moment we are also supporting uh, innovative business networks innovation clusters and strategic research centers which are subsidized by the economical agency but which were closely with us also on on the level of uh, experimental uh, legislation and experimental free zones uh, or sandboxes as you like and at the moment we, the legislation for free zones on energy is already existing but we are trying to work also on a free zone for inno innovative green um, or green innovation. Um, but that's a long term project at the moment. Um, what we also do is uh, working with an instrument called the Green Deal, which is something like a covenant um, 
but it's based on co cooperation. There is no legal framework for it, and it is just based on people or uh, non-profit organizations or even companies that want to work around the problem they uh, encounter when they are trying to green something or when, when they might want to try to make something more sustainable and they can solve them not by themselves and they're looking for companions and uh, we are offering them uh, some kind of contract form, this kind of green deal suite. It's not an idea of ourselves, but we used or borrow it in, in the Netherlands and, and it's quite successful there. They are, they are having more than two or 300 green deals. We are just at seven at the moment but it's something that uh, is quite successful. Uh, Inge? Inge? Can you go to the next slide? Yes. Uh, so back to our study, this, this was all uh, a background uh, or from with this yeah, glasses on, we were looking at some, or we encountered some, some, some questions uh, meaning that the Flemish industry, as I said, was quite technological, but um, it's it, all the technical innovation is is more at the process and product level. So we have a very good or uh, high level uh, clean tech uh, industry, but we at least we didn't get the feeling that was enough transformation in the DNA of companies itself. So we see a lot of things happening on efficiency meaning doing less harm, but never doing something right from the beginning and, and working on the effectivity of uh, things uh, by transformation of the DNA of the, within companies. And on the other hand, we were also wondering whether the transformation in businesses would uh, yeah, support the transition of society or it would be the society and the transition in society that would support the business transformation. So at the beginning of the study, we were not quite sure which one comes first and which was the chicken and which was the eggs actually. So these were the, you know, the basic questions in, of which we started out with our study and on which Inge will now uh, will go in, into more depth. In how we I, think, I think we have a couple of questions in the room here and maybe there's some other questions online uh, do you have a, a comment about the research question? Oh, well, actually, I was going to say I think that's uh, really well formed. It's it's an open question and it raises you know, it raises other questions. What you have there is really a classic reinforcing loop. So yeah, the I mean I think the business model is part of the unpacking you know, of that that loop to understand its dynamics. And, uh, it's, I think it's very well framed. Okay, thank you. Any, anybody online have any questions at this point? No? Okay. Um, so, um, no, I'll, I'll leave it for the moment. Keep, keep going. I, I do have a question, but I'm going to let, keep, let you keep going first. <laughs> no, at this moment, Inge will go into more uh, in, into the actual uh, study itself and how we started out doing uh, the approach of the study. Inge? Uh, yes, hello, good evening. Uh, so um, we started uh, back in February 2018 with uh, interviews with clusters and federations and uh, we uh, started to talk with them about how they saw, I hear a huge echo, do you hear it also? Oh. Uh, we, we, we hear you well in the room here. No okay, echo. Okay, then I will continue with, with the echo. Okay, uh, so we conducted interviews with uh, our clusters, which are really innovation uh, organizations, and with our uh, federations that regroup uh, industry sectors. Uh, we asked them which kind of uh, companies could give us good information on uh, barriers for the transition and uh, they came up with names of uh, several CEOs and innovation managers and uh, we interviewed them about the way they built their strategy, their vision 
and how they look at the research questions. And um, we also invited the 18 companies we interviewed um, and they came to the workshops. Actually, uh, Harvey and uh, Anthony facilitated some of these workshops and we tested uh, whether the flourishing business canvas could really, uh, well, let them look differently at their strategy and whether the flourishing business canvas would be able to reframe their actual strategic thinking. So that was um, the left side of our research, so to say. Uh, in parallel, we also had a broader uh, online survey um, where uh, also uh, CEOs and top management replied uh, to questions on green business modeling. And uh, we did a lot of desk research. We read a lot of articles, studies. We also explored some tools uh, on uh, greening business model strategy. And then we also had a, a technological trends cafe, we called it, with people exploring the question whether all uh, new technology, you know, technological innovation could help support people in uh, reframing their strategy and greening their business model. So um, these two tracks came together in a workshop where we invited all the participants of our research and uh, we had a discussion on policy recommendations we will present later on. Um, we Unfortunately, maybe for you only available in uh, Dutch for the moment, but um, the content of uh, the report is uh, in nine chapters. So we have uh, a general introduction on positioning the transition towards a green economy. We also had uh, the major findings of our uh, desk research, and we had all the uh, insights from our workshops and interviews. So, um, um, the CEOs and the federations asked us, well, uh, what do you think that a green business model is? And uh, what can I really understand uh, when I'm answering your questions? So we first tried to find out, okay, what do we win with the green business model? And um, we found the definition of uh, Schaltegger, which really starts from uh, the value proposition of uh, the Osterwalder Canvas, where they talk about value proposition to customers, to all stakeholders, uh, value creation, value delivery, and the capturing of economic value. And uh, we said, well, for us, a green business model is, of course, a uh, an economical viable business model otherwise the company won't grow or it will end up uh, and and not be able uh, to grow further so um, we want to have it economic viability but we also want to have it um, natural social and economic capital so multi-capitalistic and we want um, the company to uh, phrase their strategy beyond the organizational boundaries of, of the company. So that's how we introduced our study and uh, we also asked CEOs, okay, do you agree that this could be a definition of a green business model or do you understand something completely different uh, from green business modeling? Uh, one of the questions uh, we had also was, well, do people just see green business models as uh, corporate responsibility models or as optimized economic business models? But uh, to our surprise, a lot of people uh, said, well, well we, we understand this definition and we really agree that in future this will be the definition for a viable business model of a company so uh, they subscribed our vision that in fact in the long run 
uh, it will be multi-capitalistic. Um, we also had a discussion with them then um, on the way these green business models are different or, or can be distinguished from, let's say, the traditional or the classical business models. And then we came up with the following theory. So most people say, yes, for me, a traditional economical business model is really based on the value chain of a company. So it's about value creation, uh, the value proposition you offer to your customers, the way you bring value through different channels. Uh, it's a lot about the willingness to pay. If there is no willingness to pay, there won't be uh, a company or a viable economic business model. And of course, it's all about profit maximization. So the business model that has the most chances in this respect will, of course, be the best business model, so to say. So that's how they described basically their traditional business model. Then um, we asked them, well, um, have you heard about value-driven business models um, where you put, in fact, um, your own beliefs, um, your purpose um, in the center and where you, you reorient your strategy according to this core business belief. And people said, yes, we have uh, been experimenting a lot with it. Uh, we have good experience with it. Um, we also understand that then, in fact, uh, it's no longer a kind of linear business model, but all value propositions, uh, value creation, value captation, and value de delivery are centered around your purpose. So in fact, um, we have a deep-rooted belief and we try to organize ourselves accordingly. A lot of people um, said that, in fact, they, they carried out strategy building this way. So they said, okay, we have our purpose as a company. We want to go also for the long term because we are not uh, yeah, a shareholding uh, company. We are uh, a family. Uh, we want to uh, give on our uh, business uh, to our grandchildren or to the next generation. So we really are very concerned about the future and we want to build all this uh, value creation around our own family purpose. Um, and people say sometimes it's difficult, but in the long run, if we have to be honest, we will always make decisions uh, based on this concern. We then talked about, uh, well, yes, you do not have your own uh, family uh, perspective, but also maybe uh, a larger uh, aim or a larger goal. So, sorry to interrupting it. It's just back yeah, to the pre yeah. previous slide. Um, that's a, an incredibly encouraging uh, finding that you've just shared with us there. Um, what was the largest company um, that you talked to who expressed that opinion? H how big a company were they? Um, almost all companies we talked to subscribed this idea. So they... Uh, um, we had uh, a company of uh, 3,000 employees, which is family owned, but uh, who are in the food industry and export a lot in Europe. And they said, well, we are very concerned about what we are doing. Um, we really have a belief that we uh, are not just there uh, to make profits, but really to build something. Um, our family has been here for more than 50 years and we really want to give on uh, the company to uh, the next generation, not just being the siblings, but also uh, the people who live, uh, in the vicinity, the employees. So they were really very concerned about CSR, uh, about talking to employees, about um, 
creativity within the company, to get innovation started off. And uh, they always said, well, we have to make the, the balance between will we go for this idea, which is ben a benefit in the long run, and economic viability in the short run. But they were really always discussing these kind of uh, things. And, and were there any exceptions or this was a consistent opinion amongst everybody you talked to? This was quite a consistent opinion. Uh, sometimes we did not talk to, uh, well, the, the family management, but uh, to people who were uh, within the management team, but as, a, as an employee, so to say. And they also said, well, uh, all decisions in this company are always driven by the belief of the family or the kind of, uh, well, the purpose of the company. So we found a lot of people who were really, uh, well, value driven or having the ambition to become value driven. Now, what other industries, so how many were in food and, and were there other dominant industries represented? Pardon? What, what, what sort of sectors were the people you interviewed in? Uh, you mentioned food as one example there. Were they, were they all uh, close to uh, the, 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 the bottom of the Maslow hierarchy, for example, to do with food and no, uh, we, we tried sort of luxury good manufacturers, for example? Uh, we had uh, 18 companies which was uh, a cross-section of the, the Flemish industry. So we had uh, fast-moving consumables, uh, retail, uh, large retail chains, uh, automotive companies, uh, companies in the building sector, companies in the food sector. Uh, we interviewed the agriculture sector. So we had a cross-section of our industry. Right. Okay, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's really positive news that they have yeah. this opinion. <laughs> For Kuhn too, <laughs> for the department <laughs> of Kuhn. <laughs> well, value-driven value doesn't mean you're into to sustainability <laughs> yet. There's a, there's a difference. Uh, y y yes, but it, it's, it's, um, it's a good first step. Yes, True. yes. But, yeah. but but it was, it was something that we did find more in the family-owned companies than in the other ones. Because yep. I, I'm, I'm maybe going, yeah, running before now the explanation that Inge will give, but, but we saw that if you looked at, at the strategy level within the companies we, we had a discussion with, most of them, 80%, their strategy was, was, was only like up, Two, year, two years, three years, four years. There were only 20% of the companies that had the strategy on paper, which was longer than five years. So if you want to change something then, and, 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 and then become more sustainable, then you see there's, yeah, there's already a problem in, in the short term in which they want to operate and the long term you want to have a systemic uh, change in, in, in the strategy and, and the business model. So, so that sounds like an opportunity for some policy innovation, but maybe I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, no, no. yes, indeed, yeah. It's definitely an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in general, we found that uh, all people said, well, yes, I really recognize this. It's really a model uh, for my company. I'm trying to live up to this standard. I, uh, Although I do not have long-term strategic plans, I always decide uh, from the belly, and the belly is uh, the purpose of our uh, company and our entrepreneurship as a family. So uh, we talked to them about, well, maybe um, there's also another perspective that's more uh, the perspective of... Uh, a multi-layered uh, society where you have economy but also societal challenges and uh, the planetary dimension and um, people say well I understand what you are talking about and I think this will become more important in the long run but for the time being this is really difficult um, 
it's difficult because it's very uncertain. Um, it goes beyond what I am responsible for. So I would really need to talk to uh, my uh, suppliers, to stakeholders, to employees, to understand what it is about. So um, they were not very defensive, but they said, well, it's a tremendous challenge, but we think in the long run, this will be the model. So there was also consciousness about this concept, so to say. Well, I'm wondering, Inga, was there an awareness of how um, them coming from a values-based perspective could actually drive financial value for the company by per putting purpose in the middle or just that it was something good to do that honored the, the, the family purpose? Um, I think in between. It's, um, people say, well, um, I have my beliefs and I do think we have a vision on where we want to go from in, inside out, but we have not done sufficient outward in thinking in order to come up with a full understood purpose of what this could mean. So um, in fact, we also kind of maturity model where we found a lot of people who said, well, we understand that uh, the traditional model is insufficient to meet the challenges. Um, for the time being, we really do the circular thing and we try to, uh, well, act as we think uh, it should be. Uh, but we also understand that in the long term, this will be insufficient and that we will need to, um, well, think broader than that. We are already doing some projects on it, but no one really had, um, or maybe two or three startups had an idea of what this was about and how to do this. But most people said this is tremendously difficult. We will have to do this together with other people. We need support because we cannot do it on our own. So um, that was uh, basically what we found. But we did yeah. not f meet anyone. So we did in total about 40 interviews. And we also had a survey where with uh, 60 respondents. So we did not have uh, any people who said, well, I don't believe in this and it's uh, the traditional model that is going to uh, survive. Uh, all people said, well, we, we understand what you are talking about. We find this very interesting. Uh, but we have to, um, well, say that we are just stuck in here and that we do not know how to go to the next step, so to say. But there was no disagreement on the concept as such. And the difficulty people identify is that um, you need really outward thinking. So you need to talk to your stakeholders. You need maybe to talk to competitors. Uh, you need scientific data. You need also data on uh, life cycles. And you need a lot of context analysis where uh, people said, well, this is really difficult. Um, we sometimes try to uh, talk to people, but it's not very easy to, to get at. So uh, then um, we discussed with them, uh, well, if you would have um, a tryout to think outside inward, you will come up with a very different business model because you are really looking at it from a different perspective. The characteristics of green business models could be. Um, we uh, took the definition from a, a study by uh, the Association of Accountants in the UK. And um, in fact, people said, well, I really understand this because I, I really think that uh, multi-layeredness is important, that it needs to be done in participation with other stakeholders. Um, it needs to be open because uh, it needs to be very broad, not only my piece in the value chain. 
Um, the fact that it needs to be multi-capitalistic also was very uh, important, that it needed to have a purpose uh, was really important. So we also found a broad belief that people said, well, if I would look at my business model in such a way, I would come up with a new one which would meet these characteristics. So that's well, one, one moment, Inga. We have a question in the room. Go ahead, Doug. Yes. I noticed that there isn't the word um, competitive in this list here, mm -hmm. and yet it's part of the overall frame. And so you must have been mindful about how it fits here. I just wondered about your reflections on that uh, while you were going through this. Yeah. Uh... I think people believe that, um, in a way, in the long run, uh, competitiveness means that you will have to move in this direction, but that no one uh, really knows how to define this. Mm -hmm. So the basic definition of competitiveness still is a bit vague. Um, or maybe. It's a good question. I mean, the way I see it in the green context is that, that these are better companies that compete well in the marketplace with the same products and services produced with yeah. the business model. And so they're attractive as opposed to being a competitive mindset. That's how I would, that's what I'm getting from all the other positions here. And, and a company that does well like this should be preferred. And, and others would call that competitive. And, and maybe they're thinking you're out competing, but instead you're doing well by doing good. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying about that, because if you, can, if you can do better at generating social, environmental, as well as economic value, as a net value gain, then yes, that, that you could see as a competitive frame but it requires articulating what the criteria are. Yes. Um, can I ask a question? Can I jump in on that point? <laughs> um, so just on that point, that's an interesting conversation. How did you find that language has to change then in this model? Because if you're using competitive, that's sort of an older lexicon. Did you find that there was a new, is there, is there now a new vocabulary that has to be used in sort of, if you move into policy for that context? I, well, I, I think so. Um, in the meaning that myself, my background is, is more from the environmental side. And for instance, we, it's general uh, that we think about values, but if you go to accountants, they will speak more about capitals and we actually mean the same thing. So in general, one, one of the findings during, also during a conference with reporting 3.0, I saw there's, there's already a problem if you look to people coming from the environmental or business consultancy and people talking to more financial and accountant uh, consultancy. So if you, yeah, if you don't, if you in that perspective want a definition of what uh, competitiveness means, you definitely will see a different you know, filling in of the words by those two groups. Um, and at this moment, we have uh, a small study, um, is which is not going into depth on the criteria, but is 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 trying to get an insight on. If we would green the economy of Flanders, what the uh, translation could be on the competitiveness of the Flemish economy. So during that study, it's a colleague of mine who is, is doing that, we probably will get a better insight on how we would best define or uh, yeah, actually what would be the criteria of, of how we want to be describing uh, the competitive green economy or green uh, entrepreneur or green uh, business. But at the moment, there, we, we haven't filled in that definition yet. 
and definitely not by the, by this uh, study. So I I have a related question to that, which is that um, you know identified you've identified that a couple of times you said that people realize because of the complexity of of this process that needs to be undertaken that they need to need to do it with other people. How how um, and then competitiveness you know sort of comes up in that you know because if if you're doing it with other people in your industry you may feel that you're sharing information that you that's that's you know privileged information to people who you consider your competitors. So I, I'm curious how uh, people saw or, or what was their willingness that you might have seen to actually undertake this kind of process with other people that maybe have some level of competition with them in the marketplace. Well, and, and, and I'm not sure what what reflection of Ingen is, but but to work pre-competitive in Flanders is still at the beginning of, is, uh, of the road, actually. Um, what we see in the innovation clusters, at least to me, that's one of the first uh, on a larger scale working together of different companies where there's uh, an intellectual property on certain things that, that will, or that might be even, uh, might be shared, but, but um, in general, it's, it, for as far as I know, it's more at the ad hoc basis that, that people will work together when you're sure that they will benefit the both of them or the three of them. But there's definitely not a general attitude within the companies in Flanders to work together on a pre-competitive competitive, uh, level. And definitely not on something very sensitive as what they consider a personal uh, property or uh, or uh, company intelligence or, uh, or intellectual property. So it's it's one hurdle we have to overcome, but we see an opening at the moment, and it's coming from innovation clusters and innovative business networks as they are starting up uh, at this moment. Inge, I'm not sure if you want to add something to that. Yes. Um, no. No one said that uh, competitiveness is a, is a kind of uh, barrier, but everyone talked about well, it's not easy because um, you can have an. I had uh, examples of people with an entire green product, um, which was really energy neutral, but who sold their project uh, their products in uh, a traditional retail market. So the CEO said, well, uh, yes, I am the example in Flanders of uh, a green business model, but the end of my business model is the traditional retail. So um, am I a green business model or not? And we had a lot of uh, people who um, said, well, I have parts of a green business model, but it's not entirely uh, what you are talking about. And we do not know whether it will, um, what it would be for us, unless we uh, work together with other people. So um, that remains quite difficult. What was the, was the to, to your earlier comment, um, Cohen, about circular economy? Was there anything um, that came up in your conversations? I mean, I mean, to solve a lot of the um, return side of the circular economy is going mm -hmm. to require quite a lot of collaboration and I'm just wondering whether that came out um, yeah, yeah. In, in your conversations related to this need to be to have some elements of the business model that were collaborative and other elements of the business model that were perhaps that more effective. Yeah. Cool. On Yes, I, yeah. Yeah, um, no, um, no the, the, the companies who are um, working together with the colleagues working on circular economy, they, they definitely know that there is this part where it's necessary to work uh, together. Um, but there's also a larger political support to, you know, on that kind of 
things or sciences or um, yeah, movement towards something like that. So as I, as I explained before, we are trying to find a niche and working, trying to find within that niche uh, uh, to find to, or try to work and to find a place in that niche um, for for the uh, circle economy, which gets a lot of exposure, also from European level, where there is now a circular economy uh, regulation coming out. You feel that there is yeah, due to the hype between brackets uh, around circular economy. There's a lot of more willingness to to work together. And if you talk about sustainability or greening, uh, the, the, I have the feeling sometimes the yeah, words are, are sometimes very uh, changeable. In, in yeah, you have you have these new words coming up and popping up e each time, and a circular is now the new hype, and, and we yeah, green is a bit less sexy, I suppose. So that means that the support to, to work together from, from that point of view is a bit lower. We, we have about half an hour left and I'm very conscious yeah, yeah. that we want to hear your policy recommendations. So maybe we should let you drive on. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so uh, briefly, we uh, just came up with this uh, yeah, kind of maturity model where we say, okay, um, you can uh, go from uh, a very traditional business value only model towards the systemic uh, value model uh, and you have to uh, rethink then your business model in various dimensions and we ask people um, do you think there is this maturity model so uh, meaning that you should start as a company in stage one and then grow towards two three and four and people said well we really think this is very much the case because in order to uh, do three or four you really need um, a sound uh, financial situation, plus you need a, a network. So um, it is not feasible for companies just to go from stage one to stage four within three years. So people really situated this uh, as a kind of, yes, maturity model, step by step, uh, growing. They said we do have examples of companies that are startups and that immediately start in three or four, but they find it very, very difficult for existing traditional companies in stage one to develop to three or four. So uh, that's the question also of our research whether um, canvases or existing uh, methodologies could help people to rethink their strategy. And um, it, we applied it to existing companies, so not to uh, startups or to new business cases, but to existing companies who've been there for many, many years. And um, we tried to uh, take them through a journey applying the flourishing business canvas, which is uh, three layered. And uh, we uh, also uh, looked at research of other people who have uh, tried to apply these. And we came to the conclusion that uh, if you just talk about the Osterwalder canvas, you already have to uh, make a fundamental change in at least two segments or uh, components of the model in order to talk about a real business model transformation. If you just, uh, well, uh, apply some changes to one or three, uh, one or two of the segments, um, you are just optimizing an existing model. So um, if you want to rethink, you really have to rethink fundamentally. And uh, in order to come up with um, a systemic business model, you really need systemic thinking and you need to think outwards in. So you really need to know uh, what is my environment, uh, a stakeholder analysis. Uh, you need to do uh, a plotting of your role in the value chain and of other actors in the value chain in order to come up with a a good flourishing business canvas, we think. 
and um, the feedback of uh, our workshops uh, applying this the flourishing business canvas was that the participants were really enthusiastic so they really had a wow <laughs> uh, kind of uh, feeling afterwards they said it was really useful because it um, makes you think in a very different way about your business model um, it's a very useful tool for communication so uh, if you have to tell the board or investors uh, what your ambitions are it is really helpful and it has very interesting aspects so uh, the concept of co-destruction and co-creation of value also the future fit thinking uh, was very much appreciated um, but we also found that, um, in fact, um, people also of bigger companies have very little experience with business modeling. So also Osterwalder, uh, from our survey, we know that it's not really known or even applied in companies. So um, meaning that if you take management in a business modeling exercise, you need a series of sessions. You also need coaching to, uh, to help them. And uh, they have to make several iterations of their ideas. So um, it takes a lot of investment. And also we think, uh, yeah, a bit of uh, conviction of management that uh, this can really help. So that's a barrier uh, for them because we also know from our survey that uh, our uh, SMEs do not take any time to rethink their strategy in a structured way. So they just uh, do management by walking around. They uh, are very ad hoc, very uh, in the moment, and they have no experience with rethinking strategies or uh, also coaching is, is quite new to them. So that might be a barrier for them to take some time to uh, rethink the strategy. And that brings us to the results of the study. So we uh, asked uh, them, um, is the company open for the idea of a greener business model? Almost everyone said, yes, we are open. Uh, but if we then ask more concrete, uh, more uh, specific questions, uh, is it on, is it a topic on your agenda? Just 37% uh, uh, reply yes. And is it at the agenda at the moment? Then people say 23% yes, very much indeed. Um, if we ask further what they are then doing, uh, they answer a lot about greening uh, their processes, uh, product innovation, uh, environmental. Uh, processes uh, environmentally efficient processes transport and logistics uh, energy consumption in buildings but no one is really uh, occupied a lot with uh, the entire business model or uh, what it could mean in a green economy so that's a bit uh, everyone is in the first stage or the second stage, but people say, yeah, it takes a lot to go to the more fundamental questions. Um, we uh, ask them uh, what is driving the uh, ambitions of management, and then 63% uh, said, well, uh, it's the own engagement and the ambitions of management that really drive um, our strategy. It's not uh, tax or financial. Uh, issues it's not uh, that we are uh, yeah worried about technological uh, innovation or trends uh, just seven percent say that clients uh, really steer uh, the need for um, strategy redefinition and only two percent say well uh, competitors are uh, putting a lot of stress on our business model so um, the main driver always remains uh, the values and the ambitions of uh, the management. 
which I think is really significant. Um, people also say, well, um, everyone has to contribute. So uh, we think it's important that everyone takes a first step. And they uh, also say, well, these um, incremental changes, so um, efficiency of energy, uh, product and packaging improvements, they are also very important. Um, they sometimes say, well, uh, government is just looking for big transitions, but uh, we are more worried about day-to-day -day, uh, small improvements. And uh, what is also interesting is the last uh, insight where they say within the current market economy, um, green business models have a chance to break through. So uh, 74% say, well, in a way, I think that's uh, true. Just 26% say, well, no, in the current market economy, uh, there is no chance. So um, that's far more positive than we thought because we, we thought that people would be more defensive and just reply that if the, the economy in general does not change, uh, there's no uh, point in changing the business strategy. What we also found, and, and we were uh, quite uh, provocative when we interviewed them, is while you really understand uh, the concept, you also say that in the long run uh, it will be probably, uh, well, uh, a likely future. So why are you not moving or not moving faster? And then a lot of people said, well, it's not so easy because we have existing uh, governance structures, we have existing organizational structures which are really uh, very topical, very thematical, and we are not used to collaborate within our organization. So uh, it makes it very difficult to go outside and, and try to collaborate with partners because we don't even do it uh, within our own house. Um, then they said the revenue model of multiple value co-creation is very difficult because you will um, find a partner or a supplier who wants to uh, give you uh, or, or uh, supply to you um, in a circular economy inputs or resources. But what is the revenue model? How do you co-share, co-create that value? Um, People said it, it, it always ends up in endless discussions about who is responsible for what and what if it goes wrong and who will pay the insurance and, and things like that. So um, that's um, a real barrier. Um, what people also said that um, the last decades, managers were really taught to uh, focus on core business thinking. So uh, everything which was not core had to be outsourced. And the way we ask them to think now really is um, yeah, a contradiction to what they have been taught. So that's a real barrier because they say, well, I'm really focused on core business. And now you asked me to think in multiple dimensions in an iterative way together with my uh, competitors, which it, it is really uh, very, very weird. Um, so that's um, also a major barrier. Um, managers also said, well, um, we are very aware of uh, the first mover disadvantage. We believe uh, in the green economy, but we also believe that if you jump first, you will uh, jump very deep. Uh, also, people who have already jumped uh, said, well, we would not do it again because uh, it has taken us much longer uh, than we thought in advance. So this is a real barrier. And um, we also found that um, they did not link at all technological disruption or new technologies. Um, to greening their business model or their processes, which we find very weird because 
was our assumption that maybe through uh, applying industry 4.0 and, and new opportunities, you could really get ahead of um, the competitors uh, when you were greening your business model. Most people just did not understand the concept or, or the, uh, the assumption. So uh, they were very puzzled about that. Um, so they also um, connect the idea of greening really with values and, and rethinking strategy, but not at all with processes or technology. Um, and most companies are focused, that's also very important in Flanders at least, on emergent strategy. So uh, they do not take any time to rethink their strategy in an organized way. Um, they have very little experience with management tools. Only uh, from our survey, we found that the SWOT analysis is very well known. Um, but for example, only 20% of the companies or the respondents had a, a long-term uh, plan longer than five years. Are you still there? <laughs> You're yes, we, yes, yes, we are. <laughs> yeah, this okay. is really good. This, this is this is really good. We're we're we're, we're wanting you. To, we're 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 urging you on. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I will, if if you are fine with it, I will now go to uh, well the major ba uh, barriers we we found. So what people told us, uh, what is difficult, and we uh, it are. These are very different uh, subjects and topics, and we uh, ordered them according to um, the, our uh, theoretical value chain. So if you read Waarde in Dutch, this is value in English. It's a value proposition, value creation, value captation, and value delivery. Um, so uh, people told us according, uh, yeah, a green value position people said yes this is something for niches but niches are very difficult to scale up so that's a problem for existing companies it's nice for startups because it's promising for startups but for large scale companies it, it's quite difficult and uh, then people said it's also difficult uh, to collaborate with niche startups because they have a particular interest in staying a niche, because they are financially viable, because they are a niche. So um, people who have tried to collaborate with um, promising startups uh, stated this as a major barrier. Um, then if we look at uh, the barriers of um, value creation, these are mostly related to circular economy or circular business models. And people say, well, it's really difficult, I've tried, but I do not get information on the footprints of the materials I source in my value chain. And for example, retailers said, well, 20% of our uh, footprint is uh, within our own activities, but 80% is uh, passed by suppliers and we get very little information on uh, the footprint of uh, materials in the entire value chain. So there's a lot of uh, requests and policy recommendations in this area. Um, they also said, well, uh, circular business models require intensive collaboration inside, but also outside the value chain. And it's very difficult to find um, yeah, people who can help you. So, uh, for example, if you are in the paper industry and you want to find uh, someone grass cuts into paper, you are in a completely different industry than the paper industry. Um, you have to talk to uh, farmers, brewers, or, or uh, chemical industry, and they are not used to it, and they, they don't know uh, who is in these value chains. So there's um, a real difficulty in finding suppliers. Um, 
they said, well, maybe there is a lot of opportunity in uh, circular value creation for new businesses, um, but maybe not for the existing companies. So they also say, well, we see a lot of opportunities for service providers, for example, people who uh, collect grass uh, everywhere and then uh, modify it and deliver it as a resource to the paper industry. But um, if I am in the paper industry, I'm not going to uh, take, make the effort uh, to talk to uh, all kinds of suppliers of grass because that's not what my core business. So um, that's also something uh, people uh, really set in various industries. Uh, so uh, that leads them to conclusion six, that industrial symbiosis and clusters are needed in order to stimulate uh, the circle economy and to bring together uh, the opportunities. And then uh, people also said, well, maybe we should also aim more um, at moonshot innovation rather than, uh, well, think about greening traditional products because it takes a lot of effort to uh, just bring together to uh, suppliers or to companies and then, then make a joint business model. Maybe you should just look at uh, disruptive moonshot innovation and think what you have in common and what you could do together that would make more sense in the long run. Um, then about uh, value delivery, people say, well, um, it's a um, cooperative business models where you work together with uh, people living in your vicinity. Um, but then you have uh, a mega hyper local business model, so it's not upscalable. Um, there is a lot of uh, potential due to community involvement and crowdsourcing. So people say, well, we do see that uh, there are a lot of business models in this area, new business models, but maybe not uh, for existing companies, also more for startups or new business concepts. And uh, they said, well, new technologies, platforms, offer, of course, plenty of opportunities in this area. And then a lot of people also said that uh, they related the concept of smart cities um, to uh, value delivery innovation, because they said, well, we could uh, use smart cities to try out uh, green business model transformation that focuses on uh, uh, value delivery. And then, um, we also have companies um, who have tried to uh, start off product as service models within industry, so chemicals as a service, uh, for example, but then uh, they found a lot of barriers. So they said, well, uh, in order to be economically viable, we have to have uh, 10 years or 15 years contracts, but um, industry is very reluctant to have uh, these kind of contracts. Uh, they think it's rather than a lock-in if they uh, just take a product as a service for such a long run. Um, they need minimum scale uh, in order to be viable. And um, they also said the companies who uh, could buy product as a service from uh, suppliers said it is difficult because they have equipment uh, within their factory of multiple providers. So it's not that easy to just have uh, different equipment with different product as a service um, model supplied. So um, it also leads to all kinds of uh, compliance issues, who is uh, responsible for what kind of equipment and what if it goes wrong and things like that. So um, we have a lot of in our report uh, about people who have tried this business model, which seems quite sound and viable, but which has a lot of difficulty in selling uh, B2B to um, the industry.
And then last but not least, we had our trends. Uh, could be an enabler uh, for green business model transformation. And there we came, came to, we had a lot of discussion like uh, are drones okay if you uh, use them uh, in uh, the new economy? And then uh, people said, well, in fact, uh, this new technology is, is valueless. So it's the way in which you use the technology in your business model uh, that can create or destruct values. So that was, I found a nice uh, conclusion of the workshop. Um, we also had the general conclusion that in fact, it's not the technology in itself that can screw up with your business model or that can be uh, yeah, a game changer in your business model. It's rather the new business models that are facilitated by disruptive technologies that can change your existing business model. So um, these are uh, eight um, new technologies um, where we um, had in another study um, the impact on uh, existing business models and then uh, Internet of Things and artificial intelligence are the major game changers. So, um, in fact, people uh, did agree that if we apply technology wisely, it could be an enabler because technology um, industry 4.0 will um, help us to close loops and not to have just uh, linear leakage compared to other uh, historical uh, industry point. 2.0 or 3.0 um, transformation. So in general, that led us to the conclusion uh, that managers believe in the gigantic opportunities of the green economy, but they are very cautious because they understand uh, that their business model uh, needs to be transformed instead of just optimized. So they are really looking for the right way to do is to do this, they are really very cautious, um, and they also said, "Well, we really need um, clear governmental direction. Uh, we really need clear goals and milestones uh, because it's a very difficult decision process if you have to convince your board uh, that you have really to radically change your business model." You really need to prove that it is really uh, needed and there is a sense of urgency. Otherwise, people will say, just wait uh, and let's see what happens. So um, that's in fact, in brief, our conclusion. So so what? So th thank you for this. This has been absolutely wonderful. We, we, this has been uh, really, really interesting and helpful. Um, could you say, uh, we've only got a few, uh, a minute or so left, but um, perhaps you could just say a little more um, about what happens next. Uh, you, you've got some clear findings and some clear conclusions. Um, does this now lead to the development of, of policy? New policy that you would present to the politicians? That's the purpose. Um... One, one of the, the hidden uh, reasons for the study was also to, to have uh, a confirmed uh, view by industry of entrepreneurs we can present to the political world. Because before that, it was our idea as a policy officer. And the findings we now have uh, in the general remarks and the remarks on each part of, of, of the business model as, as described by Inge, gives us uh, a, a, a serious ground on which we can fur work further. Um, because what Inge describes were, were the remarks, but in the, the, the former slide, Inge, um, I'm not going to read it, but just to point out what, what this is. Um, these were, uh, during the remarks, of course, the, the entrepreneurs and the, the uh, the companies had also some, some questions on the position or the role that the government had to play. And some of the remarks on that next slide, Inge, 
Um, are, are uh, actually some questions. And what we are trying to do now, and, and in the last slide, of, uh, it, it shows a, certainly one of the most major role. We, we will have to play a facilitating role, and, and we can do that by offering a platform. But that is something we want to do on a very short notice, but in the future still. At short notice, we will uh, map all the inputs we got out of this study. We will try to see what some of the gaps are because it's just, of course, um, a representation of a limited number of people. So we, we have to figure out if we have uh, missed something out that is out there and which is still not in our study. And then we will try to, to see also um, what our role could be in offering solutions to the questions. Um, in which perspective we are alone on that market or can we find um, uh, people to work together as for instance uh, NGOs or uh, federations or uh, yeah, people working already uh, bringing some of the solutions. So, we will, we will try to find a niche in which we can be, as a um, government, uh, can be uh, unique and we are not doing over the work done already, maybe by some consultants. And that analysis is, analysis is happening right now and will end up in, in a, a project uh, form um, that we will have to represent uh, inside to the management and also with our uh, political, yeah, with our ministers and the cabinet. And then hopefully by after the summer, we can uh, start to do actually some work in the field and hopefully also together in the co-creation process as we did now for this study. Uh, so it's, it, it keeps practical and it, it answers right away to the, the questions that uh, entrepreneurs will have. So that's basically the general approach which we are trying to develop at this moment in answer to the questions asked in, in, in the study. But it's it's not as concrete as you might have known uh, or expected. What kind of actions are you planning? But uh, as, as said in the last slide, we definitely will have a role or a large role to play in, in the facilitating part, in offering some tools, in coaching, because there is definitely a need or a large need in that. And as said before, um, one of the challenges will be also helping bring together in competitive surroundings, a lot of companies working together, and that will be a challenge as well. And we have to fill, yeah, find a solution to that as well. So, so th thank you for that, uh, uh, looking for that view looking forward, uh, Cohen, that, that's very interesting. Uh, so, so let me uh, just say a few uh, closing remarks. Uh, first of all, thank you, Inga and Cohen, for the presentation today. Thank you for uh, being so open with us and sharing uh, the results of this research with us. Uh, it was exciting for myself and several others of us on the call to be, uh, play a small part in, in this work, and uh, it's, it's really fantastic to see the, uh, the final output uh, of it. Um, I, I would invite you to, to not be a stranger to us as you go forward. Uh, and to keep sharing if, it, if it's possible. I know a number of us in the room are, are chomping up a bit to take this presentation to some local policy people here <laughs> and say, hey, these guys in, in, the, in uh, Belgium are doing some uh, great stuff, uh, we should be doing the same thing. So I think you've inspired quite a few people today with uh, sharing your work. Um, and uh, yeah, so th thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Please, uh, please keep us in the loop on, on what happens uh, next and any time you'd like to, uh, have the opportunity to share what you're up to, then uh, we will be delighted to have you back again. So th thank you, everybody, uh, and uh, see you all uh, on the second Tuesday of next month, uh, and we'll, we'll be talking Flourishing Enterprise Institute, which uh, no doubt some of the research questions that have been uh, uh, bubbling under the surface of today's uh, discussions, uh, like how do we do this pre-competitive -collab pre collaboration and uh, collaborative business modeling, Maybe those will be some of the things that will uh, be of interest to the Flourishing Enterprise Institute uh, work. So thank you, everybody.
Uh, have a good rest of your day, good rest of your evening, and sleep well, uh, Cohen and Inga. Will do. Yeah.